In this video, uh, my intention is to review some important angiosperm families uh, illustrated, uh, including some line drawings from this very excellent book by uh, Dr. Wendy Zomlofer, currently at University of Georgia. So the angiosperms, uh, this is the largest phylum of plants, far, far, far and away the greatest number of species, over a quarter of a million described species, over 400 families, and in this video I'm just going to review 10 uh, of the most important families, important in the sense that they are large, have a large number of species, and that they have a lot of familiar members uh, for us because of uh, different food items or fuel or uh, food that we might feed a livestock, fodder. So first I'm going to talk about four families of the monocots, uh, the Amaryllidaceae, the Poaceae, the Ericaceae, and the Orchidaceae. So the Amaryllidaceae is the Amaryllis family. Uh, it includes bright, showy, ornamental flowers like these amaryllis flowers that you see here. Uh, or here's another example. There are a number of different color morphs, uh, different types of these bulb type plants, as well as a very common uh, plant growing around here in the southeastern U.S., daffodils, uh, in the genus Narcissus and other uh, plants that you might grow from bulbs like hyacinth, also in the Amaryllidaceae. So how would you recognize that these are monocots? Well, look at the number of petals and sepals. Well, where are the petals? Here are the petals. They're actually all fused into this tube, and the thing that look like the petals are actually these uh, sepals that are all kind of brightly colored, yellowish. But there are one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Uh, in addition, if you look down underneath here, you'll see a bunch of these leaves. Uh, these leaves are kind of fleshy, but they also have that parallel leaf venation that is very typical in the monocots. Onions are also in the Amaryllidaceae. Uh, they are Allium sepa. And you can see here, this is a cluster of flowers at the uh, head of uh, an onion plant that grows above the ground. The onion itself is the bulb that grows below ground. And here's a section through one here that you might recognize as a red onion. Garlic is also in the Amaryllidaceae, same genus as onions, as are leeks and shallots and green onions, and a lot of those very pungent smelling um, vegetables that we use to season many of our foods. The Poaceae is the grass family. And you may not think of the Poaceae as being uh, a flowering plant, because the flowers typically don't look very colorful or, or ornate, and that is because they don't have petals. Uh, all of the grasses are wind-pollinated, and wind-pollinated flowers don't have brightly colored petals because the purpose of the petals is to attract a pollinator. And if the pollinator is, doesn't operate on vision, as the wind clearly does not, um, it doesn't matter what kind of petals you have. So instead you can see that grass flowers have these very uh, highly branched stigmas that are for catching the pollen from the wind. Now the anthers may be found in the same flower but it's uncommon for the flower, uh, the stamens and the pistils to be uh, ready at the same time. This is to prevent any uh, inbreeding. It doesn't make much sense for a flower to pollinate itself if, if it can avoid it, because the purpose of having pollination and sexual reproduction 
is to increase genetic diversity. So often if you see something like this, what you're looking at is called a spikelet, and it is made up of multiple smaller florets. Each floret is in itself an individual flower. And if you were to look inside there, typically these florets are very small. You need a hand lens to be able to see these structures like the, the floret with its uh, stigmas and the styles and the uh, anthers and a number of highly specialized structures in there like the palea and the lemna uh, and the glooms, things like that. So what are grasses? Well, you probably think of lawns as being a type of grass, and you'd be absolutely right. Uh, this type of grass, you wouldn't expect to see any flowers on because we keep these types of lawns mowed so that they do not go into flower. Sometimes we let the grass grow longer so that we can use it for hay uh, to feed animals like cattle and horses and other ruminants. Wheat and all other grains are in the grass family as well. There are many species of uh, plants in the genus Triticum that we get different types of wheat, whether it's semolina wheat for producing pasta or uh, durum wheat for typically for baking bread, all in the genus Triticum. And uh, wheat is an important plant uh, not just for providing nourishment, as, but also for inspiration to artists such as Vincent van Gogh, who painted these wheat fields in France. Uh, as I said, all of our grains, including corn and rice and barley and oats, are in the grass family. Here's an example of rice. You can see the flowering heads growing in this rice paddy in Japan. Uh, as well as the many, many species of bamboo. There are approximately uh, 600 described species uh, within this subfamily Bambusoidae, which are different types of bamboo, which is a uh, woody representative of the grasses. It's not technically, uh, doesn't form a tree, but it just forms this uh, sort of woody growth that's important for things like building and construction uh, and is an important material for all kinds of uh, tools and such uh, throughout Eastern Asia, as well as a food source for pandas. All right, our third monocot family is the Ericaceae which is the palm family. Uh, these are the only true trees that are found within the monocots. Uh, monocot flowers, uh, like palm flowers, typically have three carpels that are fused together. Uh, these flowers also tend to be uh, wind pollinated, so they're very small and they just produce lots and lots of them. That's a common theme. If you produce uh, wind-pollinated flowers, you typically need to have a lot of them in order to achieve uh, pollination. Uh, the date palm, Phoenix dactylifera, is one example of a palm tree. Coconuts, uh, Cocos uh, nucifera, are another example of a uh, member of the palm family growing on a coconut palm. And you can see that there are these one, two, three um, structures that look like holes. They don't go all the way through unless they're drilled, but that kind of belies the monocot origins of coconuts in the coconut palm. Uh, palms are typically a tropical family, but there are a few subtropical ranging into temperate habitat palms, including the palmetto, which is the state tree and one of the most important symbols for the state of South Carolina. And the origin of uh, the palm tree 
dates back uh, as a symbol for South Carolina dates back to the days of the Revolutionary War uh, when there were fortifications built along the coast of South Carolina that were built using logs of palmetto. And palmetto uh, and other monocot woody structures have very long fibers. If you ever tried to break a stick of bamboo across your knee, uh, you know that it does not just snap in half, it actually um, tends to, to stay more or less intact. It might bend, but it won't break. And uh, when the British fired upon these fortifications in South Carolina, that happened to be true even when your cannonballs were fired at them. The cannonballs would just bounce right off of those fortifications. And so the palmetto became this symbol of the, the spirit of independence um, in South Carolina. Fourth family of monocots and the largest monocot family um, is the Orchidaceae or the orchid family. Now you might not know this if you just explored uh, in the temperate regions, but uh, again the majority of the diversity of the orchid family is found within the tropics. And exactly how many types of orchids there are depends on who you ask, uh, because there are a number of native species that are growing out uh, in the uh, different habitats in the, of the tropical environment. But there's also a huge number of ornamental cultivars that have been produced by, um, by human, humanity for centuries. But there is a running theme within the orchid family in that you have three petals and three sepals. So what we're looking at here uh, are the one, two, three sepals and one, two, three petals with the central petal uh, shaped into a structure called a labellum, or a lip petal, which can be very highly modified into a number of different ways. So be on the lookout for this pattern in all of the orchids that I'm going to show you pictures of here. So again, you've got one, two, three petals and three sepals behind them. And the lip, these are, um, are Ornamental orchids found growing in Hawaii. Another type of ornamental orchid. And here you can see underneath there the leaves uh, that have that parallel leaf fination, indicating that it is a monocot family. Here are several different colorful varieties of orchids. Again, we've got one two, three petals with that ornamental uh, bilaterally symmetric lip petal in the middle with three sepals behind it. Uh, these are paphia petalums, which are another type of very ornate uh, orchid. And the, the lip is uh, forms this pouch. Another type of orchid. In this case, the lip petals are on top because the flowers are twisted up like that, so that they don't. They appear to be on top rather than on the bottom. But all orchid flowers are at least a little bit to very, very strongly bilaterally symmetrical, not radially symmetrical. Here's an example of a vanda. You can see a fairly small lip petal. Uh, More orchids, just an amazing array of colors and uh, patterns on the petals and the sepals. Cattleya is the corsage orchid. Uh, and there's only one orchid in the entire orchid family that is uh, considered to be an edible, and that is the vanilla plant is actually in the Orchidaceae. It is the one edible orchid. It's extract used to season uh, Confections.
throughout the Western world.